So today's lecture is going to be just a brief introduction to microfluidics. So this is a really hot research area. It really spans a lot of fields. Uh, there are chemists who do microfluidics, but there are also engineering people, physics people who do microfluidics. Um, and the really idea is to miniaturize some sort of analysis for chemists, so we would like to think of chemical analysis, onto a small chip. And so there are other sort of names for this. Oftentimes people will call it lab on a chip, something like that. And the idea is to get all these processes that you would do in a lab, pipetting, separating, detecting, that kind of thing, get them all on a small chip, integrate them so that the processes can be done without a lot of a human uh, interaction uh, and get it all done. Um, the advantages of working on a chip um, are pretty big. Uh, the first one is that everything's done in a small volume. So for instance, let's say you want to do a forensic analysis, right, and you don't have much sample. Well, you know, if you could, again, design a microchip to do that, then you could use um, small volumes. They're inherently uh, using small volumes. Um, they can be amenable to mass production. Not always, um, you know, I'll be honest, not always. Uh, uh, but the goal sort of is that you could make, you know, a disposable chip for a lab, uh, you know, a pathology lab or something at the hospital, um, detect it and throw it out. Um, they often are faster. Uh, that's because people use them for automated types of analyses. Um, uh, they can be cheaper. Again, if you're using smaller volumes, you might be using small amounts of reagent. Uh, again, it depends on how you fabricate them, um, but you can make them uh, disposable. So those are some of the advantages of why people are moving um, to uh, this type of analysis. Let's talk just a few of the basic ideas then about how things differ sort of in a chip. And one of the things, and one of the things that we explore in the lab that we do is flow. Um, so there's a type of flow called laminar flow. And laminar flow is where you have parallel flow streams. So imagine kind of things are flowing all in one direction, and they're sort of flowing in parallel. So they're not mixing, they're not going every which way. The opposite of laminar flow is kind of turbulent flow. And so turbulent flow, imagine, you know, that you have like your stir plate, right? It's really going around, you know, and so stuff is going around every which way, you know, you know, kind of thing, uh, with turbulent flow. But laminar flow, things are kind of flowing all in a parallel direction. So the th stuff here is not mixing very much with the stuff here, and certainly not mixing with the stuff up there. Um, and so we get laminar flow in a chip. And in some ways, this is good. Our stuff will flow. And in other ways, it's bad. Uh, it's bad for mixing. And so if we have a channel in our microfluidic uh, channel, things will just tend, again, to flow uh, in a parallel fashion. So if I want it all to mix together, it won't. Um, and again, we're going to look at some of that um, in uh, the lab. Um, and the reason that is simply that we have what we call low Reynolds numbers. So you can actually calculate the Reynolds number of your chip. It's a long calculation. You'll enjoy it. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll calculate the Reynolds number for the chip that you make in the lab. The well, Reynolds number, though, means you don't get a lot of mixing. Um, and so uh, people have to think about how to get around that. Um, and so there's a number of ways they have gotten around that if you want mixing, but basically you have to put in little like um, impediments that make it go up and down or around and around, and that way it'll tend to mix a little bit better. It's also a little bit hard to pump on a chip. We're going to pump on our chip, but our chips are not going to have particularly small channels. Um, so it's hard to pump on the chip. Um, so let's think about pumping for just a minute. Um, 
uh, it's, it's hard to pump, if you, especially the idea of microfluidics is most the channels, it's microfluidics are right in the micron range, and 50 to 100 microns is really typical for a size of a channel. If you have nanofluidics, that usually means that one dimension is on the nano range. So now they're even going into, you know, sub one micron dimensions and you can call it nanofluidics. But it's really hard to pump through a tube or something that's 50 to 100 microns. And so instead, they use electroosmotic flow, which is called EOF. So this comes up as the same thing if we were doing capillary electrophoresis in the lab. Uh, basically, as long as you have a glass wall, uh, that glass wall is going to have a charge because it's going to have these silicate groups that are going to be negatively charged. And so if you put a buffer layer in there that has some positively charged ions, uh, basically if you apply then a positive voltage, so this is filled like with sodium plus, right, and chloride, we got to have a uh, sample. But now I apply, sorry, a negative, a negative voltage at the end, right? All of those positive ions are going to go towards the anode. So these sodiums right, are going to go towards the anode, and they end up pulling the solution with them. So that flow is called electroosmotic flow. And so it's really convenient in a microfluidic job because it means you just basically stick in two little electrodes, apply a voltage, and you get to get your stuff to go. Um, and so this works really well on glass chips, not as well on uh, PDMS, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that's the way people typically get their um, fluid to flow around their chip is to use this um, electroosmotic flow. Um, let's talk about materials for a minute. So, you can make chips out of glass, or you can make them out of a polymer called PDMS. So, polydimethyl siloxane. Uh, um, it's a polymer, and in the lab we use PDMS. Um, you have a monomer and a curing agent, you mix them together, it causes it to polymerize into nice long chains. The only problem with this PDMS is that it tends to be hydrophobic. And so that means it doesn't wet well, uh, that that solution doesn't want to be um, on it. And you also get very little EOF, again, compared to glass. So we are not going to do EOF in this lab, because it doesn't work very well in PDMS. But uh, if you wanted to get around that, Uh, you can sometimes get around it by putting a coating um, onto your PMS chip. PMS they like though, right, because it's cheap uh, and it's pretty disposable, right, it's plastic. So if you want to make a device um, uh, that's easy to use in like a clinical ad, something like that, uh, PMS ends up being cheap and not fairly disposable. Um, so the idea about making chips it's fairly universal. Um, typically, you make a master. And so if you want a channel, right, for the master, right, you want to make something that has things that go up, right? And then what you do, right, is you pour your PDMS. Right, so I'm going to pour my PDMS into here, cure it, and then what I end up with, right, is a chip now that has channels, right, running through it. There's lots of ways to make these. In the lab, we're going to do this very simply. We're going to make shrinky dinks, right, so you can see it really well. Pour the PDMS over it, make your channels. In reality, in the research lab, 
most of this now is done with photolithography. Um, and so photolithography um, is where you cover something with a mask and you shine light on different areas. Those areas basically develop or are eaten away, you take the mask off and you can pour uh, and make your master. So lots of good photolithography going on, but you'll get the idea of how to make a chip in this lab. That's one of the reasons I like this lab a lot. You actually get to make something. When do you get to make something in chemistry lab that you can take home? Uh, almost never, right? So it teaches you a lot of chemists make devices. It's again, a hybrid of chemistry and engineering um, and making devices. And then you can do whatever you want on the um, microfluidic chip. In this case, we have a chip that you can do a titration on, um, but, um, there are lots of different applications from DNA analysis to protein analysis to, you know, amino assays, um, uh, anything that you can really think of. Uh, people now are really trying to put on a microchip and make it easy uh, to automate the, and do the separations.